Almighty. January 20th, 2009. Following the swearing-in ceremony of President Barack Obama at a luncheon, Congressman John Lewis walked up to the President and asked him to autograph a commemorative photograph. The President signed that photograph because of you, John, Barack Obama. The day before that historic inauguration of our first African-American President, Congressman Lewis told a visitor to his office that Barack Obama is what you get on the other end of that bridge in Selma. Fast forward to March 7th of 2015, last month. John Lewis was back at the other end of that bridge in Selma, the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Alabama, where he had been beaten nearly to death in a voting rights march with hundreds of other protesters. He was back on this occasion, on the eve of the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday, to introduce Barack Obama. And in his introductory remarks, he said, if anyone had told me when we were marching across that bridge that I would return here someday to introduce the first African-American president, I would say, you are crazy. You have lost your mind. You have no idea what you're talking about. And then he turned and he hugged President Obama mere steps away from the place that he had been beaten 50 years before within an inch of his life. Progress. Americans have a deep faith in progress. It fuels our American dreams. It's part of our DNA. It's written into the very charter of the nation. When Thomas Jefferson wrote those immortal words in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thomas Jefferson was articulating a vision of progress an aspirational ideal embodied in those words, pursuit of happiness. And those words are as powerful today as they were in 1776. Americans' faith in progress is at the root of our faith in the future, our historic and well-known optimism. Our faith in progress is something that has given us over the centuries a new birth of freedom and a new deal, a new frontier and a great society, mornings in America and bridges to the 21st century, the audacity of hope. So on one level, we have to understand progress as a very real thing. I'd be a fool to deny this. We have seen great moments and advances in progress over the course of our history. We're in the middle of celebrating and commemorating and interrogating not only the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Movement, but also the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. And it's very easy to look at that long history and see great changes. Much progress has been made since the days of chattel slavery and Jim Crow segregation. And those changes, that progress, have more often than not come to us because of the tenacious efforts and the bold courage of those who have confronted the indignities and inequities of American society and sought to change their nation. Barack Obama and John Lewis are just two of the most visible examples of that reality. But progress is also problematic. And looking at the history of the United States requires us, in some ways, to rethink progress, even and especially when it seems most self-evident. It is important for us to understand that when progress is concerned, where progress is concerned, progress is not always inevitable 
or irreversible. In fact, it is rarely either of those things. Progress is rather paradoxical. And what I mean by that is that a paradox of progress means that certain progress for certain people does not necessarily guarantee entire progress for all people. That sometimes our progress requires us to erase the more intractable problems, and sometimes progress inspires new forms of reaction and repression. That legal and political progress does not necessarily always translate into the lived reality of progress for many people. And if we look at American history, there is no greater illustration of the point that I'm trying to make than African American history. I mentioned that we are in the midst of a commemoration or a celebration of 150 years since the Civil War. One of the things that that commemoration and celebration has done for me is to get me to think about what happened after the Civil War. How do we make sense of that period of expanding democracy in the wake of the abolition of slavery? And we should be mindful of the fact that the Civil War itself teaches us that over 700,000 people died before four million enslaved African Americans walked free. But the Civil War and the period of Reconstruction following that great national crucible offers us a critical opportunity to think about the nature of progress and its limits in American society. After the Civil War, there was a moment, about a decade or more, where the nation attempted to reconstruct or reconstitute itself by advancing democracy in what my mentor, the historian Eric Foner, calls a grand experiment in biracial democracy, where for the first time in American history, black people and white people came together in political institutions to remake the nation in the wake of emancipation and abolitionism, to make real the promise of equal citizenship that was enshrined in the Constitution in 1868 with the passage of the 14th Amendment. This was a period of time where there were great transformations in social relationships, great transformations in economics, great transformations in politics, society, and the law. This was a time that many historians have talked about as one of the most revolutionary and certainly the most transformative in American history. We can look to South Carolina, the first state to secede from the Union on the eve of the election, right after the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860. South Carolina, which was the leader of secession, an incubator of white supremacy, became the location of interracial democracy in the wake of the war. In 1868, that same year that the 14th Amendment was enshrined in the Constitution, there was a constitutional convention in South Carolina. And because South Carolina had been, a, it was a state at the time that had a majority black population, the constitutional delegation at that convention was majority black. This was unprecedented in the history of the nation. A majority black delegation, an interracial delegation coming together to rewrite the state constitution. And in the process, they proposed and ratified the first co-educational, integrated, tax-supported public school system in the nation. It was a radical, radical departure from what had come before. Much progress indeed. And there were stories like this all over the South and all over the nation during this period of Reconstruction. But in 1876 and 1877, when the federal armies moved out of the South and the white redeemer governments were on the rise, that promise of progress that was represented in this interracial democratic experiment of reconstruction was eclipsed. And with that eclipse came black codes and Jim Crow laws, literacy tests and poll taxes, redeemer governments, and the full reconstruction and reconstitution of a white supremacist ideal. It was also a period of time in which nearly 4,000 black people were lynched by white mobs in extra-legal forms and practices of racism. All of this taken together constituted what historians call the nadir of black America from the late 19th century extending into the early 20th century when black people, their freedom, their equality, 
their rights of citizenship were rolled back in unprecedented ways. It is also worth noting, given the topic of my talk about rethinking progress, that this was also a moment that coincided and overlapped with the period of American history that we call the Progressive Era, that the denial of black freedom and the progress of reform in other arenas coincided, and that wasn't coincidental. We are reminded again in our contemporary political climate of those same lessons, of how black freedom and equality of black lives can be denied in the midst of other kinds of progress. We just have to be, we just have to look at our Facebook news feeds, our Twitter feeds, the videos of the murders of black people by white police officers, to see that every 28 hours on estimate, a black life is extinguished in the age of Obama. We could ask if they were still here, Trayvon Martin and Tamir Rice and Michael Brown and Eric Garner and Walter Scott, what they think about progress. And we must be mindful of the fact that these murders, ongoing, unceasing, so deeply troubling, will, years later, be viewed by the historians of another era of the lynchings of our time. This paradox of progress, particularly insofar as race and racism are concerned, became very personal to me when I traveled in 1997 to Greensboro, Alabama, near Selma and Montgomery, to help rebuild a black church that had been burned down in an arson attack and a racist hate crime. I was there with a group of students from Columbia University and Barnard College, and we were there to rebuild this church that had been destroyed by a white supremacist. And on Wednesday of that week, I joined a group of folks from the community and my fellow church rebuilders in a church gospel saying at a local, uh, in a gospel saying at a local church. And in the course of that gospel saying, everybody got up from the pews and we formed a circle around the interior perimeter of that church and we held hands and we sang gospel hymns and we prayed together and we sang civil rights songs and freedom songs. And as we formed that perimeter around the church, I saw an elderly black woman with a walker who was sitting in a pew by herself in the middle of the church. And for whatever the reason, I decided to break from the circle of my friends and brothers and sisters and go sit with that woman. And we held hands and we sang together and we prayed together and we bore witness to that moment together. And after we were done, she turned to me and she grabbed my hand and she said to me, thank you, brother. I said, no, thank you, ma'am. I didn't understand why she was thanking me. And she said, no, no, no. She grabbed my hand more tight. And she leaned closely, more closely to me. And she said to me, I want to thank you because I'm going to be 90 years old next week and no white person has ever come to hold my hand. There are moments in our lives that change our lives, and that was one moment in my life that changed mine. Not because holding my hand, my white hand, was a sign of progress for that 90-year-old black woman, but because our moment together holding each other's hands was a stark reminder of how elusive progress still was and still is because racism is so tenacious. For 15 years after that moment, after that week in Greensboro, Alabama, I organized groups of students to go down south to rebuild more black churches that have been burned in arson attacks. These were not black churches that were burned in the 1860s or the 1960s. These were black churches by the hundreds that were burned during the 1990s. And I kept going back and keep going back because there are still burned churches to rebuild. As I've grown older, I've begun to think more critically about progress. I've begun to understand that the national narratives of progress that we Americans like to tell each other are, as Dr. Malk said in his talk, myths. Howard Zinn talked about the myths of progress that animate our national erasures. And I think about progress critically 
even and especially when I'm feeling that I'm enjoying a certain amount of progress. Four years ago this spring on Memorial Day, my husband, CJ, and I were married in the state of Massachusetts, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It was a beautiful day, it was spectacularly sunny. All our friends were there, our family members. We were married by the former mayor of Cambridge, who himself was the first openly gay African-American city mayor in America. It was a historic day, a wonderful day, a day that would change our lives. And contrary to so much of the hoopla from those who would oppose marriage equality, those who think that marriage equality is a threat to civilization in some way, our wedding went off without a hitch as we got hitched. I remember shortly before we got married doing a radio show where I was being interviewed and I was talking about LGBT rights and the advance of marriage equality and the progress that LGBT people have been making in American society. And a caller called in after I was interviewed, and this caller was full of hate and full of prejudice. This was a caller who wanted me to not just not be married, but probably perish from the earth. And at the end of a rant that I don't really remember, he said, you and your people will ruin our civilization. And I remember at the time, I had just come off a holiday week with my boyfriend, fiance, and now husband in Brooklyn. And we were both off from school. I'm an academic and he's an educator, and we have school holidays off over the, over the Christmas break. And so we spent the entire week sleeping in, watching movies, reading, ordering Chinese food, sitting on the couch. Most of the week was spent sitting on the couch. And I told this guy that. And I said, you know, sir, based on my last gay week, I can guarantee you that my life and my relationship is not a threat to civilization. It's a threat to motivation. <laughs> this spring, the Supreme Court of the United States is going to rule on whether or not gay marriage is legal. In other words, whether or not same-sex couples have the equal rights to marry one another in the eyes of the law just like their heterosexual peers have for as long as we can remember. And there's a certain air of inevitability around this court decision. People are already predicting that it's going to be a win, it's going to be a slam dunk, the court's going to surprise us, and marriage equality as we know it will be a done deal. People are talking about the post-marriage landscape. And I certainly hope that the Supreme Court will rule in our favor, will finally hand down a decision that makes me and my husband feel like equal citizens of this nation. But I worry about the air of inevitability, this idea that progress is certain and progress is sure. There are only two possible outcomes with this court case. One outcome is that the Supreme Court rules against marriage equality, in which case we will continue to struggle. We will continue to fight until, hopefully, someday, the court and the nation sees the light. Another option, another alternative, the other alternative, is that the Supreme Court rules in our favor, that marriage equality wins, and that the fight is over, that we will usher in what some commentators and critics are calling a post-marriage landscape. And I worry about that too, because I worry so often these days, increasingly, that the marriage equality wing of the LGBT movement has been conflated with and equated with the movement itself more broadly. In opinion polls, people are asked all the time whether they support marriage equality. Very infrequently these days do people ask if they support LGBT people or LGBT rights more broadly. And I worry, regardless of what the Supreme Court rules, because if marriage equality wins, we will still have LGBT people living in states across the nation where they cannot adopt children, where they cannot foster, become foster parents. We will live in a nation where older and aging LGBT people often die alone, neglected, denied health care. We will live in a world where nearly 50% of homeless youth in major American cities are LGBT people, many of them trans, many of them people of color, many of them undocumented. We will still live in a world 
where LGBT kids are at a two to three times, uh, are two to three times more likely to suffer from some kind of mental health crisis, are two to three times more likely to be addicted to drugs and alcohol, are two to three times more likely to be bullied in school, to be alienated from their families, to be rejected from their churches. We will still live in a nation where young people who do not conform to our gender norms or our sexual norms are placed in conversion therapy programs to try to change them, to try to improve them, to try to fix them. We will still live in a society in which queer people of color are murdered at rates that are absolutely unconscionable. But those murders do not have the YouTube videos streaming, do not have the Twitter feeds exploding. Those folks are murdered, those people are raped, those folks are done great violence to often in the shadows of invisibility. We don't even know their names. We barely even know that they exist. If marriage equality wins, there is still so much more work to do. And I worry about a world that focuses so exclusively and intensely on that kind of progress, the kind of progress, frankly, that my husband and I have been able to enjoy, but that so many people in our queer community can't even dream of. And I think about this in the context of a young man who I never knew, who I heard of about the same time that my husband and I were engaged. How many of you have heard of Carl Joseph Walker Hoover? Has anyone in this room heard of Carl Joseph Walker Hoover? That's not uncommon. Carl Walker Hoover was an 11-year-old African-American boy, football player, good student from Springfield, Massachusetts. And for whatever the reason, Carl was someone who was bullied intensely in his school. His mother pleaded with school authorities to try to protect him, to try to take him out of this environment and make school a place that he would want to go. But the bullying and the taunting and the hatred so overwhelming for Carl that at 11 years old, he hanged himself. He took his life, another precious soul gone, far too soon. Carl could not be saved by gay marriage. Carl committed suicide five years after the Goodrich ruling made marriage equality legal in Massachusetts. He committed suicide three months after our first black president was inaugurated. That moment when John Lewis and Barack Obama hugged each other and talked to each other at the inauguration. Neither the election of the first black president, surely a sign of progress, nor the advance of marriage equality in Massachusetts and across the nation, surely a sign of progress. Neither of those things could have prevented and saved Carl Walker. And so when I think about progress now, knowing what I know, having seen and experienced what I've seen, I think about progress more critically. I think about progress in the context of who is left behind, who is neglected, who is left for dead, who is left out of the progress that we experience. We live in a nation and an age that is full of paradoxes of progress. We live in a nation where we have elected and re-elected the first black president of the United States, and yet also a nation with rising incarceration rates, murders on the streets of unarmed black men by white police officers, huge racial disparities in nearly every facet of American life. We live in a nation that is contemplating the election of the first female president of the United States, and yet it is also a nation where gender gaps in pay persist, worse for women of color than for white women, where we have ongoing assaults against reproductive freedom, and where the war on women is real. Sexual assault, 
rampant in our college campuses. We live in a nation of immigrants, an increasingly multicultural nation, in which immigrants are still stigmatized and harassed and deported. We live in a nation where many of us in the LGBT community can get married, and maybe all of us in the LGBT community can get married come June, and yet we still live in a nation where queer youth are on the streets and taking their lives, and where queer people still suffer discrimination in the workplace, in healthcare, and in housing across America. And we live in a nation where there is incredible wealth and where the entrepreneurial spirit runs rampant. And yet we also live in a nation where the gap between rich and poor is at an all-time high, where the 1% of a disproportionate share of the wealth and the 99% are struggling, where Wall Street is back and Main Street is still left behind. We live in a world full of paradoxes insofar as progress is concerned. And if we as a nation are ever to really earn our reputation as a progressive nation, we are going to have to not only acknowledge but confront the paradoxes that endure. My hope, my faith for us as a country is that generations from now, when future Americans look back on our age from the vantage point of a more perfect union, they will be able to say to us across the ages and across the graves, because of you, people, let's get to work.